Again, our Father, we come to you tonight, preparing our hearts, Father, as we are preparing to open your word. And as we search the contents, Father, of your message tonight, help us not to look at these things, Father, that are coming in the future and say, well, so much for their life. But that we will understand, Father, that people who go through these things will be friends and family members and work associates and neighbors and people who have never received Jesus as their Savior. Well, Father, let us never look upon these people as just people who deserve these treatments, but rather, Father, to help us to speak to others about their need for Christ. Father, let us know that the time is near. Give us the urgency of the heart that we need. You told us, Father, that in the last days, the love of many would wax cold or grow cold. And Father, the church is cold, no longer cares about the hearts of men and women. Well, Father God, our hearts need to be made alive and made well, Father, that we might be the Christians you would have us to be. Speak to our hearts tonight, Father, that we might know the truth. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're going to turn probably to the most well-known text of Scripture when talking about the rapture, and that is Revelation chapter 19. We're going to see in Revelation 19 how what we see when we're going to come with Jesus. And we're going to start with verse 11. So Revelation 19, 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. As we talked about last week, there are three phases to the battle of Armageddon. This, as we're going to talk about tonight, is the third phase, the battle of Megiddo, or the battle of Armageddon. The word is Harmageddon. That's where we get the word Armageddon, Har meaning mountain, the mountain of Megiddo. And so Harmageddon, I mean the valley of Megiddo, the valley of Armageddon. And so we see here that this word Harmageddon is where we get the word Armageddon. But like I said, this is the third phase of the battle. As we saw last week, there was the first phase, and that was Jesus coming to the place called Bozrah, which is the capital of that area down in lower Moab, uh, in what we call today Lower Jordan, into that area in the mountains just south of the Dead Sea and to the east of the Dead Sea. 
And that is what is called today Petra, and what was called back then Petra. Or as we mentioned this morning, it was also called Mount Seir. And so we see here that the, the Jewish people are going to leave. They're going to go there. They're going to hide there. God is going to protect them for three and a half years. And at the end of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to send a contention of men down there, and they're going to try to attack them one last time. And that's where we go first. We come out of heaven, as we're going to see tonight. We're going to go straight to Bozrah or to Petra. We're going to take care of that army there. Then we're going to go to Jerusalem to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is just to the east of the wall there, what we call the Temple Mount, where the, where the Dome of the Rock is. There's a valley going down. It's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It connects to the Kidron Valley, just north of it, and to the south, to the Hinnom Valley, which goes around south of Jerusalem. And this valley, the Bible says, is going to be a great battle, and the blood is going to be as high as the bridle on the horses. What's very interesting is God's going to divide the whole mountain of olives. Mount Olive is going to split open. The Jews that have been captured and are in Jerusalem are going to escape through that, and God is going to literally kill all those who killed his people and to, who hunted down his people there in Jerusalem. And then from that point, we go to the Battle of Megiddo, which we normally call the Battle of Armageddon. Everybody, if you ask them, do you know about the Battle of Armageddon? They will say, yes, it's that battle up in those, that big plain there and by the, the mounts over by there and all of that stuff. And, you know, they're, they're right. They're partially right. They're third right in the aspect that there are three phases in this battle. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. That's the judgment that's going to come right after Armageddon. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's that double-edged sword we heard about in Revelation. And with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked with his words. He's going to literally speak. That's the same voice. And you say, well, how can that happen? It's the same voice in Genesis 1. And the Bible says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. In this case, God is going to say, let them be dead. And boom, every cell, every organism, every atom, every proton, neutron, all the other things that so minute we're just now discovering is all going to fall apart into oblivion. No wonder the Bible says that the blood is going to come up to the bridle of the horse. If you want to see how, what that's all about, all you got to do is see Zechariah chapter 14. If we had time, we'd go there. It talks about men just melting right off their bones. Some people believe that that is a nuclear attack. I don't believe so. I believe the nuclear attack is very, very bad, but I think this is an attack of God. I think he's going to speak, and it's going to happen. It's going to have more power than that of a nuclear bomb. We're going to see two things in our text today. We're going to see the intervention of the Savior and we're going to see the indictment of the Antichrist. The whole battle of Armageddon is one purpose. He's going to free the people in Bozrah. He's going to free the people in Jerusalem. And he's going to attack and capture the Antichrist. He's going to attack the Antichrist. He's going to attack the false prophet. And he's going to take the devil by the scruff of the neck. And he's going to chain him and throw him into eternal darkness, into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. I can't wait. I can't wait. We see here in our text tonight in verses 11 through 18, we'll see, first of all, the interruption of his arrival. In verse 11 through 13, we see his unique appearance in 11 and 12. He looks different, doesn't he? The Bible says we see he has a magnificent steed. He's got a beautiful horse, a white horse, the Bible says. It's not unusual. We've already seen the white horse, have we not? In the earlier part of Revelation, the Antichrist came on a white horse. Does he really have a literal white horse? I don't know if the Antichrist does, but I know Jesus does. I believe it's a literal horse when he comes back. And I also believe that there is a possibility that the Antichrist will ride a literal white horse. The reason why I know that is because General Allenby, when World War I did not ride his white horse into Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem was conquered during the Ottoman Empire. They sided themselves with Germany. 
and General Allenby of the British uh, Army Infantry rode into Jerusalem, started to ride into Jerusalem on his horse and got off before he entered Jerusalem, they literally turned the city over to him without firing a shot. You know why they did? They thought he was the Messiah. Those Arabs thought he was the Messiah, so they gave him the city. So he got off his horse and he said, I am not going to ride into Jerusalem like my Savior is going to ride in and literally walked into Jerusalem. And I believe the Antichrist is going to do the thing, even though I think he's not going to get off his horse, I think he's going to ride in. But Jesus is going to come back with a magnificent steed in verse 11. Verse 11, he has a matchless title. Verse 11, the Bible says very simply, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. You see, back in the letters written to the church, he is known as the faithful. He's also known as the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That faithfulness speaks of his willingness to be there for us and to ensure us that all things are done according to his word. His, his, uh, his truth speaks about his word. And so we see here his matchless title. Verse 12, look at his merciless gaze. The Bible says his eyes are like a flame of fire. Do you believe his eyes, Pastor, are literally a flame of fire? No, I just believe it's the gaze he's talking about. That there is judgment in his gaze. Boy, my dad could give you a look. And you knew it was a, it was a certain look, you were in trouble. My mother had worse, but it, the, the, that's a different story, isn't it? But the bottom line is there was a gaze and all my dad had to do was look at me and you would stop. You just stopped what you did. It, it was the look. <laughs> and you didn't, have to des- you didn't have to describe it to my brother because he knew the look too. In fact, he got the look much more than I did. But anyway, <laughs> he has a merciless gaze. In verse 12, we see his majestic crowns. We had time I could go into more about what that's about. I believe those are the crowns that you and I place at his feet. The Bible says he has what in verse 12? The Bible says he has many crowns. Not M-I-N-I, little bitty crowns, but many as in multitude. And I believe those crowns represent us and all that we have done to give them to him, to make him Lord of Lords, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then he has a mysterious name. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Well, what is that, Pastor? I don't know. (laughs) I don't think we'll ever know. It's just one of those mysteries in the Bible. Note the first time he came as a meek Savior. This time he comes as a mighty sovereign. This time he comes as not as the meek and mild Galilean, but he comes as a mighty God of heaven. We see here in verse 13 his unusual apparel. What is he wearing, preacher? He's wearing his judgment robe. Look at verse 13. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We see his his judgment robe and his judgment name. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, which, by the way, all of the heaven that you see out there, all the stars, it's going to pass away. And the earth that we live in, everything you see on this earth, including this building, is going to be gone one day. That's why we shouldn't put so much into this world, folks. I don't know how many of you have been seen that you like a school's being knocked down or tore down. Isn't it sad? I went to my, my grandparents' place many years ago and the little elementary school I went to for a long time was all torn down. It's gone. And I was sad about that because I thought, well, I went to school there. I spent some time there. And it was a loss in my life in that aspect. But folks, this world, don't put your roots down in this world. This world is going to be destroyed. It's going to be remade. We see here the judgment name. He's his, the living word and the written word. He's going to judge everything by his word. Those people that said, I don't believe that Bible, preacher. Guess what? He's going to pull it out. He's going to judge them by it. He's going to literally speak the word, and the word is literally going to cause everything to fall apart. We see in verse 11 through 13 his his second advent. 
His coming again, the Savior's second advent. In verse 14, we see the Savior's saintly army. In verse 14, we note the description. The Bible says very simply, the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed Him on white horses. A lot of speculation. Who is that? Some people say, well, that's the angels. I believe that's you and me. Because we're given white robes, are we not, as soon as we get to heaven? And so we see here we got white robes, the armies in heaven. You didn't know you were going to be drafted, did you? We're going to be on white horses. We're going to come back with Jesus. Well, you say, well, I don't want to fight. Well, truthfully, you know what? I don't know if we will or not. He's just going to speak the word and everything's going to die. But we're going to be there to do what we can. Note their dress, their fine linen, that white and clean that meant their purity was in Christ. Folks, your purity is not in yourself. Your purity is in Christ. And, and they had white horses. That means we're going to identify with the victory of Christ. We're going to be counted as pure because of Jesus. And we're going to be on white horses showing His authority. We're going to have authority too. Do you realize we're going to go back and we're going to come back with him and we're going to judge? First of all, we're going to judge angels. Corinthians talks about that. Know you not that you're going to judge the angels? We're going to judge demonic beings. We're going to judge these things that cause problems all over the world. You and I are going to judge these things. And then the Bible says we're going to judge others. We're going to be in the millennial kingdom being going to and fro all over the world for the Lord to judge matters for a thousand years. Better bone up on your Bible. <laughs> Look at verse 15 and 16. We see the Savior's stellar assault. It's going to come out of heaven, folks. He's going to assault the earth. Not salt it as in S-A-L-T, but assault it as in an instrument of war. Look at verse 15. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. It's an instrument of war, is it not? Sharp sword is not a letter opener. <laughs> well, you know, I just like Jesus when he was a meek and mild fisherman, when he was a carpenter. Folks, he's the God, the King of kings and Lord of lords here. This battle of Armageddon has the King of kings coming to it. And in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now listen to what it can do. Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. When I preach the word, folks, that word goes into the very soul and spirit of men and women today. That Holy Spirit takes that word and it's like a sharp dagger and literally pierces the hearts of lost people and Christians, if you allow it. You know, I think a lot of Christians have gotten hard hearts. You know, in the, uh, Hebrews, the third chapter, it tells us, beware lest we develop a hard heart. You don't see people crying anymore. You don't see people weeping anymore. You don't hear about people who are sad about people dying and going to hell anymore. Div uh, div division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God speaks to the heart and the intents. You know, God doesn't say, well, I think he's going to think that. I think he's thought that. I think he's going to do that. God knows. And God judges. Verse 16, we see his inscription of worthiness. On his thigh, the Bible says in verse 16. On his thigh, on his robe and on his thigh, a name is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. There are two thoughts about this matter of the thigh. First of all, the warrior's place for a weapon is on their thigh. You hang a sword on the side here. You can hang it in your, on the back. It's good to walk around, but usually the sword goes on, this, on the thigh area there or hang a pistol or whatever. So that's equated with the military aspect. But there's another very spiritual significance that I read about and heard a few years ago, and that is that Jesus is, is, of course, obviously Jewish. He's going to be wearing a talit, a prayer shawl. And on that prayer shawl is written names. And then on that prayer shawl will be his name that he has. And as he's sitting on the horse, 
that part of the prayer shawl that has his name will be literally sitting on his thigh. It's a very interesting thought, is it not? So we see here that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. Folks, this is, this is God coming back. We see in verse 17 and 18 the invitation of his angel. Now this is where we get into the battle of Armageddon. We're just stepping out of glory just now. John takes here in verses 11 through uh, 16, we're just getting out of heaven, out of the gates, folks. Now we see the battle in verse 17 and 18. In verses 1 through 10 of chapter 19, we note a great feast that is in heaven with the faithful. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to have a great feast in heaven. However, in verses 17 and 18, we see what John Phillips calls a great gory feast for the fowls. The birds are going to have their feasts. They're going to gather from all over the world and they're going to have their feast. We see in verse 17 and 18, who was called and who was consumed. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains the flesh of mighty men the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave both small and great it's going to be a great gory feast on the earth for the fowls Jesus is going to come and destroy the entire army what has happened is simply this the Antichrist has sent an army down into the Petra area. Jesus first goes there again and, and frees the Jewish people there. He brings the Jewish people as he comes back up to Jerusalem, divides the Mount of Olives in half. They escape out. He destroys the army that's been there to garrison in Jerusalem that have the Jewish people captive there, and he destroys that army. Then he goes to Armageddon. Now, here's what's happened. They have gone there. The Antichrist has garrisoned his army there in Megiddo, right off of the Mediterranean. It's right off the Mediterranean Ocean. This is a perfect place to gather 200 plus million men. It's a huge valley. It's absolutely unbelievable. I can't tell you, begin to tell you how many battles have been fought in this. Napoleon fought here. Pharaoh's fought here. Babylon fought here. Assyrian fought here. There's all kinds of troops that have fought in that battle. It's going to be everybody's gathered there. And what's happened is the Antichrist has come up into that area to stop the kings of the east with their 200 million marching army coming from China, Japan, North Korea, South Korea, all of the east. They're coming over through the past the Euphrates River. It's going to dry up and boom, they're going to run right into them at Megiddo. And they're going to begin a big fight. And Jesus would come up and interrupt their fight. What happens when you've got two brothers fighting and you interrupt that fight? What usually happens? They turn on you. I told my children a long time ago, if you see two people fighting, be careful. Don't jump in between because they'll both turn on you. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus comes in and as he's coming in to attack, they literally turn their guns on him, foolish mortals. They turn their guns on him and begin attacking Jesus. And we see this sacrificial feast of God. He's going to speak and literally the flesh will melt off their bones. A la Indiana Jones. Keep the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> it's just going to literally woof and it's gone. If there's a bunch of horses, there's not going to be any horses. Everything there is just going to melt. And, and the Bible says in Zechariah 14, it's just going to be a mess. The scavenger of the fowls of gore will come and they'll literally eat and take care of the mess there. You see, you had a battle before. We talked about that in the battle of Gog and Magog when they came in and they had such a horrible battle. What's going to happen? It takes seven months to clean it up and the Jewish people... Even if they find a little bone, they have to mark it because they can't touch a dead bone because they're unclean. 
So they have to mark that so nobody will touch it and they can, somebody can pick it up and take it and depose, dispose of it as they're supposed to. So Jesus says, I won't have to worry about that. All the Jewish people will be free from that and just get all these nasty, unclean birds to come and eat it all up. And there'll be no problem. Won't have to spend seven months in, in cleaning up. Won't have to spend all that problem. He said, I'll just take care of the issue right away. So we see who was called. In verse 18, we see who was consumed. Again, the mighty men, the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, those who sit on them, the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. Everybody who came to that battle, kings of the east, kings of the south, kings coming out of, out of the uh, uh, army of the Antichrist, all of them. Those condemned by God, they will die. These are those who have reviled the saints of God. They've sought after the saints of God. They've hunted them down. They've killed them. They've martyred them. They've beat them. They've starved them. They've put them in jail. And during the tribulation period, they've done all manner of evil to them. God is going to literally dissolve them into nothing. Those who rejected the Savior, those who had the opportunity when the 144,000 came to them and said, you need to receive Christ. You need to receive God. And they put them in prison and they killed them. They martyred them. These people who rejected Christ are going to be a part of that army. And then there are those who have regarded Satan. Those who have said, I'll take Satan. And folks, don't you honestly think, doubt in your mind one iota, that there aren't people out even today who said, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in Jesus. I also believe in Satan and believe that I want to follow him. There are people like that today. And in the tribulation period, especially at the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will bring himself as God. It will be Satan incarnate in the human flesh of the Antichrist. And he will literally rule the world for three and a half years. And they will follow him. We see those who are called and those who are consumed, those contending against God, those who allied with the wicked Satan in his worldly system. They followed him. They're going to die. This is the intervention of the Savior. The Savior is coming back again to Petra, first to the Jewish remnant who received him, secondly to the Jewish people who were captured in Jerusalem, and finally third to that army, that wicked army, the Antichrist, the the. Uh, False prophet and Satan himself. He's going to grab him, folks. He's going to chain him up. He's going to wrap him up in a chain and throw him in the bottomless pit. You know, there are some people believe that bottomless pit was that section that was there in Sheol between paradise or Abraham's bosom. I, I hate to use the word paradise because you think of the Muslim uh, connotation, but it was called paradise. Jesus said, uh, this day I tell you, you'll be with me in paradise. But it was also called Abraham's bosom that you looked across. There was a great gulf fixed between the two. And he looked over there and he saw the rich man in, in torment, in hell, remember, in, in Luke chapter 16. And there are some people believe that that gulf that fixed between the two is that bottomless pit. And that Satan will be placed in that bottomless pit for a thousand years. We see here the indictment of the Antichrist. He's going to take the Antichrist in verse 19, his fatal decision. And I saw the beast and, and the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. We see in verse 19, his fatal decision. You chose poorly. The Antichrist made the wrong move. That is the way with all lost people, folks. There is a season, a short season where lost people say, I can do my own thing. I have my own life. I have my own way. I can control my own thing. I have heard people all my life. Preacher, I want to die and go to hell and be with all my friends. I have. I've heard them all my life. Well, old Bub over here, he's in hell, and I'll meet you there, Bubba. I remember going to a funeral one time where a guy placed a Budweiser can, a full one, completely full, hadn't been opened. Put it in the casket. Said, Bubba and I are good buddies, and, and I'm going to see you one day, Bubba. I'll see you and we'll have a drink. And I thought, you fool. There is no drinking in hell. 
The rich man cried out, Oh, Abraham, please send Lazarus to dip his finger in water that I might have a drop on my tongue that I would be in such torment that I could have something to drink. There is no party in hell. There is no fun time in hell. Jesus is going to come and He's going to attack these people. They are condemned. We see His confederacy of obstinacy. He says, we're going to go against God. And we see His confident of opposition. These people followed the wrong God, did they not? There are people today, folks, they're following the wrong God. They're going after the wrong things. They're trusting in the wrong things, just like they will in the, in the tribulation. Be careful who you follow. They may lead you in direct opposition to God. Be careful. Be careful who you align yourself with. Be careful who you say, this is the group of people I belong to, because they may one day tell you, we are, do not believe in God and we're not following Him. That's exactly what happened to these people. We see the folly of their decision and the foolishness of his dissension. The audacity of his confrontation. I'm going to attack God. How foolish. The absurdity of the challenge. God, I want to, I want to fight you. <laughs> Imagine the foolishness. You know, I wouldn't mind going to Pee Wee Herman and say, look, I'll take you on, bub. Let's have a fight. But you get some of these big football guys, front linemen, you know, and you, hey, come here, Bubba. <laughs> I remember on our honeymoon, we went down to Orlando and we got in late at night and the hotel we stayed in, they had the old USFL League, the United States Football League, the old USFL, and there were all these football guys running around and I was like, good night, where did they get these people? You know, I thought I'd died and gone to Gath. We see here the absurdity of their challenge through the foolishness and folly of the sinful mankind. God in heaven is amused at their stupidity. Psalm chapter 2, verse 4, He who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Laugh at them. Finally, in verse 20 and 21, we see His final defeat. We see His fatal decision. I'm going to attack God. That's where He's going to go all along. Where does he get this that he thinks he's going to do this? Satan knows he's a defeated foe. Satan knows that Jesus beat him not only when he was in the wilderness. When he was in the wilderness, you know, Jesus, he tempted Christ. Christ would just say, it is written. Be gone from me, Satan. He told us all we have to say is, Satan, get thee behind me. And in the name of Jesus, Satan would flee. But beloved, where does Satan knows he's not going to win, but he's going to convince the Antichrist and he's going to convince the false prophet and he's going to convince millions and millions of people that they can win against God. You know, I had a girl one time, we were working and doing our, our practicum work at a, at a shelter for runaway girls. And I remember hearing about this one girl who was a, a believer in Satan and a, and a worshiper of Satan. So I got along with her, we were playing ping pong. And so I was talking to her, she goes, I said, I got a book for you to read. And she says, what's that? And back then it was in, you know, early 70s. It was Run Baby Run by Nikki Cruz, who was in a, a uh, Satanist type cult and, and uh, a cult. And the bottom line was, she goes, oh, it's one of those God books. I said, yeah. And she said, you do know we're going to win in the end, don't you? And it was so cold. She goes, you think it's going to be you. You think it's going to be your precious Jesus. She goes, we know that it's going to be Satan who's going to win. And he's going to open hell. He's going to get the keys back and he's going to open hell and let everybody out. And we're going to populate the earth. And you know how cold that made me feel? Do you realize how, how absolutely mind-boggling that was to me? And that was the voice of the tribulation generation, folks. Deborah and I talk about this a lot. When we see people walking in a mall or we see people driving a car, we see somebody on TV who say something, I look at that and I said, that is a tribulation generation person right there. If Jesus would come back today, that person would be in the tribulation. 
We're seeing people right now. We work with people that are going to go through the tribulation. We live next door to people who are going to go through the tribulation. We see here that these people think they're going to win. Oh, fools, foolish people. Verse 20, look at the defeat of satanic leadership. And then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. They didn't pass go. They didn't collect $200. They went straight to hell. The Bible says they were cast alive. We see the beast of the sea, that's the Antichrist. The beast of the earth, that's the false prophet. All foolish mortals, Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Folks, these people are going to reap the whirlwind. Verse 21, we see the defeat of the sinful lost and the rest. Oh, what a tragedy. That phrase, the rest. It's just like when God created all of the universe and said, oh yes, and, and He created the stars. And the stars too. And the rest. The cook. The person who drove the tank. The person who rode the horse. Whatever they're going to be using, I don't know. The person who wrote the letters that worked into the, uh, the office. The person who carried the gun. The person, whatever position they were in. The rest, the Bible says. The rest. Those who rejected Christ. And those who reviled Christ. Those who cursed Him. The Bible says that during the tribulation period when these sores come upon them and when the heat pours upon them from the sun, rather than turning to God and saying, Oh God, give us mercy. They turn to God and they curse Him. They revile Him. You know, it's bad enough to hear people use the Lord's name in vain out in public. Imagine hearing people curse God. What that's going to be like. Revelation chapter 20, we see quickly through verse 1 through 3, And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. A different study for a different time. But we see the Antichrist is conquered. His, his reign is finished. The false prophet is crushed. His religion is finished. The devil is confined. His rule is finalized. And Jesus is Lord and He will now institute the thousand year millennial reign at the conclusion of the, of the battle of, of Armageddon. Jesus is going to spend a little time judging the nations, the Gentiles. It's going to judge the Gentiles that are alive. Not everybody's going to be there in that valley. He's going to gather the people from all over the world and He's going to judge them. It's the goats and sheep. And the way that the millennial kingdom is going to be judged is this. What did you do with the least of my brethren? That's what's going to be said. What did you done to the least of these my brethren? Because if you did it to them, you did it to me. And the Gentiles who hated the Jews and killed the Jews, they will all be the goats and they'll go to hell. And the Gentiles who loved the Jews and took care of them and fed them and clothed them, how do you know this stuff? When you were in prison, you visited them. You gave them food. You gave them clothing. When did we do that? When you did it to these, the least of my brother, you did it to me. And that's what will get them into the, the kingdom. Jesus is going to establish the kingdom, but quickly look at verse 22. Chapter 22, excuse me. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20 and 21. This is what we ought to say, folks. And he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. And amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, John said. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. John said, if only you would hurry, Jesus. If only you would hurry. 
Meanwhile, as we are praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus, what are we going to do? Verse 22 tells us what to do, folks. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That means we ought to share the grace of Christ with everybody we know. About how to be saved. Come to know the Lord before this horrible thing takes place. I'm reading a lot of literature today. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of stuff online. I read, 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 read. My, my old head sometimes gets so full I want to shake it loose to get, it, get the stuff out. The bottom line is everybody's talking about it, folks. People aren't coming to Christ like they used to. Young people are not coming to Christ. What are we going to do? We have to reach the millennials. That's what they're all saying. We've got to reach these young people. We've got to reach these young people. They're just not listening anymore. But nobody has the answer how to do that. You know why? Because they love sin more than they love Jesus. And that's the bottom line. We have a generation that loves sin more than they love Jesus. But that doesn't mean we stop. It doesn't mean we don't pray. That doesn't mean we don't share. That doesn't mean we don't invite. It means we do all that we can while we can for whom we can. Come quickly, Lord Jesus but grace be to all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. More especially during this time of living in the last days, Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ that is ours in Christ Jesus, that to be absent from the body, whether through death or even to be raptured with our body, is to be with the presence of the Lord. O oh, Father God, give us wisdom in this time of great peril. Your servant Peter wrote to us through your inspiration, Father, that the last days would be perilous times, and we are here, and the perilous times is this, that if we don't get busy, Father God, there are going to be millions that are going to die and go to hell during the tribulation period that don't need to. Give us wisdom, Father, that we might share. Give us wisdom, Father, that we might care. And Father God, there might be someone here tonight, I don't know hearts you do, that is without Christ. Give them the opportunity tonight to receive Jesus tonight, that they would come to Christ today. For those who need to come and pray, Father God, whatever decision, we ask that your will be done and your heart be shown to us, Father, for your will. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.